Um, is there a spiritual way to kill an animal? Or more bluntly, how would Jesus kill an animal? So much of the Western world is based on Christianity and patriarchic values. If you find out the entire foundation has been a mistranslation and it's gone skewed, and then we can recorrect that, the domino effect of what it'll mean, even though it happened 2,000 years ago, it'll transform. What does it mean to really be a Christ follower or a Christian? This film isn't bashing any religion. There's maybe all these things they don't agree on about divinity, about heaven and nirvana and this, and all these conversations that you could argue about. But one core piece that unites all of them is this, we shouldn't be unnecessarily killing other beings. Today I sit down with Cameron Waters and Kip Anderson to discuss their new film, Christspiracy. What would Jesus do? Would he condone the slaughter and consumption of animals? I'm not religious, far from it. I mean, I have heard of Jesus Christ and God, of course, but that really is the extent of my knowledge. It's good to know your limitations, right? However, given that there are more than 3 billion Christians worldwide who follow the teachings, qualities, and spirit of Jesus Christ, I do think this is a very interesting question to ponder. In this conversation, we discuss groundbreaking discoveries related to religious texts, whether or not one can be Christian slash spiritual and eat meat, and much more. Go into this episode knowing that this is just one perspective and one documentary. I would strongly encourage you to go away and ask more questions and discuss this with both religious and non-religious people before forming strong views. I'm not in a position to say, what about when such and such said this in a certain scripture? But I have reached out to Joel Salton from Polyface Farms, who we speak about in this episode, and have invited him to come on the show with Cameron so we can hear different perspectives. So hopefully that takes place someday soon. Before we get into it, we recorded this conversation prior to the release of the documentary in theaters and online. For information on where you can watch Christspiracy, visit Christspiracy. Com. Okay, let's do it. What would Jesus do? Kip, Cameron, thank you very much for doing this. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Are you guys from LA? I know you used to live here, but are you just here for the premiere or you live here? We're both born in Georgia, okay. but um, <laughs> we, I've traveled all around. I'm, I live in Mexico right now, but I was in San Francisco a long time. I've been all over the place. Kind of like him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was born in Georgia, but then moved uh, to LA 13 years ago, maybe 14 now. Um, but since pandemic era, hopping around a lot. And we've just been filming and all over the place. So kind of in and out six, five, six months out of the year in LA. And so you're just here this week for the premiere? Is that the main reason? I am, yeah. 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 In Mexico, be moving out here in a few months, so again. Okay. Well, I must admit, I missed the premiere because I was in Mexico. <laughs> so that's my excuse. Transit back from Mexico. How was it, the premiere? Epic. Yeah, it yeah. was really, really good. It was like fully packed and everyone laughed, cried. The whole, all the emotions, super electric. And yeah, it was, went really, really well. Did that feel like a bit of a milestone moment for you guys? I know that this, this film in particular was a while in the making. Yeah. I mean, we did UK um, just a week before and the difference of the experience of doing the UK premiere versus the LA premiere for me personally was significant because the UK, there were a lot of strangers. So it felt like, you know, turning on in a certain way to kind of present the film to new people. Um, whereas in LA, half the audience were, were people that I kind of know or have particularly seen the journey over that long period of time. So it was a lot more emotional, kind of, I would almost say like ceremonial in a sense, you know. More the, personal. Yeah. What's what's the reaction been like from people so far? Been awesome. Been awesome. It's a lot of it is not what I expected. I went in going thinking it was something. Everyone has a preconception of what it is and then coming out like, wow, it's not what I thought. So much more, so different. Um, and it was awesome. What is that kind of misconception or, or how are people thinking about it before they watch it? And what's well, that change? It's, it's called Christspiracy, which is, you know, a title we've always been playing around with what should be called. And so that has a very, you know, it's an intense name. And so people come in thinking, one, I think notions of whether it's debunking something or is it going to bash Christianity or it's just all, is all Christian you know, the whole film's about Christian or about Jesus. 
And then, you know, you've seen it. It's just so much more. It's not bashing anything. We go into Buddhism. We go into every single angle of the ethical pillar of what it is with our relationship to animals. Mm -hmm. And is there an ethical way to eat animals? And what are the sociological impacts, social justice impacts? And, you know, we go across the board. So I think that's something that everyone's surprised of the breadth and the full spectrum of what the film is. Has the, I mean, something that really stood out to me, and I need to say from the outset here, I'm probably in the 15% of global population that would, I guess, describe myself as not a religious person. So I'll probably ask a lot of silly questions today. <laughs> That's me too. Isn't me? <laughs> uh, and it, it'll take me two or three passes going back through the film to kind of, for everything to land. But I learned a lot. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions that I'd like to speak to speak to my friends about that are religious which i think is uh pretty powerful and probably one of the things that you wanted to do with the documentary was provoke questions afterwards um, so some of these questions i'm hoping that we can go through today but one that thing that that really landed for me you focused a lot on the interpretation or misinterpretation translation of various religious texts and what that might mean in terms of uh, whether or not Jesus Christ was condoning and supportive of the killing and consumption of animal foods, or was he in fact for animal liberation? And I feel like that's the part of the documentary that will probably shock or grab hold of the audience's attention the most. Do you think so? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. I mean, that's that's the... The conversation generally gravitates towards that mm -hmm. mostly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a... From a historical perspective of just what's revealed in the film of, you know, what started Christianity and Jesus, Jesus, the most, you know... Uh, the, the, what the most famous or how do you say the most yeah if you google any the, list out there most famous people in the world jesus is always at the top of the yeah, list he's one. always number one and then that his who he was and what he was really about and the movement he was part of has been covered up and and the true intentions and what they're all about and what he did four days before he got crucified has been covered up and when you find out the whole story of what this movement and he was about and how far did their compassion extend to and their activism extend to? And uh, it's a massive transforming what, what it means to be Christian and a mm. Christ follower. If you, if you look into this and, and, and you find that this is indeed true, um, it's a massive, you know, it's a massive shift in, in, uh, I mean, in the religion. That's sort of the reason how we even landed on the name funny enough is because when Kip and I teamed up, I come from the Christian background. I was obviously very focused on that side. Um, but you know, him coming from his background is, is shared in the film. We kind of covered different bases and went on this journey, but over time, the film was called something else actually, when we were working, uh, with our streamer. And then the more we went into the story and the more we put the film together, the more it naturally gravitated towards a through line with this Christ story and hence why we landed on Christ spiracy. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's, it, it definitely has a pull or a draw to it. So you said you're Christian. So what are Christians taught about Jesus Christ and the consumption of, of meat? Well, when I was growing up in church, a common phrase that we used to say, uh, kind of a funny one when we would go to meal after a church service would be good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a little laugh that everybody would get, but that does kind of sum it up. Um, I was, you know, you'll see in the film, I was a part of a Christian youth hunting club as a kid going out to hunt uh, wild animals. I was a part of a fishing club as well, um, went 40 miles offshore every year uh, catching fish. And then just in general, the church barbecue is just a staple. Um, and within all of that, there's this notion, that kind of dominion notion, which is a, a word we discuss in the film, this idea that God's given us uh, animals for us to eat as a part of our consumption. Um, you know, depending on what day it is, is how much that element's focused on, but it's a general undercurrent, you know? Right. But you use the word cover up and I think you use that in the film as well. So if I'm hearing this correctly, what you're saying is that 
there has been intentional misinterpretations of religious texts? I mean, I would say whether it's intentional or not, um, it's hard to, it's hard to know. It's 2000 years ago. There's people now like my pastors, for instance, the, what we always like to share. We talk to my pastors, some of my childhood pastors in the film and to their defense, they don't know a lot about this either. They've just been taught what they've been taught by the person who taught them, who taught them all the way back. Right. But, um, most of the people now, I don't think they really realize that they're is this other side to the story or these other questions that could be raised in context with the scripture and the historical documents that we have, because it's just been so long ago, they're just doing what they know. But I do think, you know, many, many years ago, 2000 years ago, there were, I probably think some intentional decisions, especially around the canonization of the Bible, which, you know, scriptures were included, uh, certain groups that were there and how they were spoken about at the time. So we can get into some of that too. And where, whereas the previous films have worked on the conspiracy or the cover up is very now, like when I'm speaking to someone from Greenpeace or Sierra Club or American Diabetes Association, I know that they know that they know that there's a link and they're consciously doing it. And they're, um, and so it's very present with Sea Spiracy too, all those companies. But with this film, when we're talking to these pastors, they don't even know what they don't even know. They've never even been asked this question, but there absolutely was a cover up. It just so happened to be 2000 years ago. And it is, it's a very, you know, deliberate cover up back then of Jesus, you know, kind of giving a little bit of way, but Jesus of Nazareth, where it's really Jesus, the Nazarene. And that has been continued for uh, you know, 2000 years now today that that's covered up that, oh, it's where he's from. No, it's who he is. I mean, once you know who he is, then it just sparks a whole rabbit uh, rabbit hole of discussion and exploration of what that means if he is a Nazarene rather than he's from some town named Nazareth. And that was deliberately covered. Why is that important? Because once you realize he's part of the Nazarene movement, then there's a lot of things that you can dive into um, that can be, you can, I don't always like to, for, <laughs> I don't want to go say some wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, well, yeah, there's, uh, it's funny, before this, I was on line uh, on a two hour phone call with the religion news service, <laughs> going over an interview that we had specifically about this topic, because it's so deep. And she was like, we did an interview a week ago about this. And she's just so focused. And she's now going down the rabbit hole of the Nazarenes and just, whoa, it goes so deep. There's all of this historical documentation about this movement that I myself as a, you know, a lifelong Christian never heard about. Um, I don't see anyone else speaking about it, but there's so much historical documentation there about uh, this movement that had very particular intentions. And the, we the reason why it's relevant is because it all centers around the temple at the time of Christ and the animal sacrificial system, which again, I think as Christians, we don't really know the scale of what was actually happening in the temple. We think that there was just a cute lamb, you know, sacrificed to, you know, it's this beautiful scene and it's celebratory and it's this, you know, it becomes a meal and it's this, but it's, it's much different than that, which we cover in the film. And so I think the historical picture of what was actually happening there brings to light something that's very, very relevant in terms of the ethical treatment of animals argument. What was it that prompted you to question all of this? Um, you know, as a, as a Christian, why, why did you not just accept that? that story and that information that was putting forward? Why did you want to explore more deeply? Right. There were little seeds that were planted uh, all through my life since I was a kid, just certain questions. I was deeply involved with, you know, Bible study and Sunday school and all those things. But without getting into those little seeds, the big turning point was when I was a uh, late teenager, I started doing the Daniel fast, which is a kind of Protestant Christian based nutritional plan. Uh, that became popular where you refrain from animal products for a period of time, like a fast. Um, and it's paired with scripture and all of these things because there was a biblical prophet named Daniel who was a slave in Babylon. And rather than uh, eating all the, the slave food, um, which was meat and this and that, he said, I don't want that. I, I refrain from that. I just want pulses, uh, you know, seed bearing plants in water. That's it. And it was a threat 
for him to do that. And they were trying to say, no, you can't do that. And he said, well, just give me 10 days, test me on this diet and see how I fare against the rest of the slaves in the kingdom. And he tested stronger, healthier, and wiser than all the other slaves. And so that's in the scripture. And there was a popular thing called the Daniel plan, um, which uh, I started doing with my family. And somewhere in the process of doing that, something kind of awakened in me, uh, a, a certain connection, the way that I felt. And it started raising a lot of early questions that then I'm like, well, if this is in the scripture, is there anywhere else in the scripture that talks about this? Because man, I love meat. It was kind of in a way uncomfortable for me because I worked at, at the time I was working at a barbecue restaurant. Um, but once those first questions raised, it sent me down a path of really, you know, beginning to ask him, well, what would Jesus do about this? You know, uh, and more specifically, rather than just the diet aspect, I started to become aware of my food choices in general and the impacts they make ethically. Um, so that's a, a pretty common kind of catchphrase, right? What would Jesus do? Yeah. If that, if that's kind of something that Christians live by. Oh yeah, I got it on my wrist right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> WWJD, it's a bracelet and the whole phrase, yeah. Right, which gets to the, really the heart or one of the stories through the documentary. You know, what was Jesus's position on the killing and consumption of, of animal foods? Right. You just mentioned there you were on, was it a two hour call? Really challenges someone that's Christian, right? When, they, when they're confronted with this information. What was her response to that? Well, because she's a journalist, she, she can't say too much. We actually had a call with her the other week and we were pressing her to ask her what her opinion was, right? That was her. Uh, we were asking her what her opinion was. She's like, well, I can't really give my opinion because I'm a journalist, but you can tell she's a journalist that deals with a lot of people in a movement, uh, a current movement, which is called the deconstructionist movement, mm. um, which is all around the world, there are people that still want to have faith of some, of some kind, uh, Christian faith, Judeo-Christian faith, but they're struggling with how it applies today and the inconsistencies and contradictions in certain scriptures and this and that. And so they deconstruct, that's where it comes from, their faith down to the rawest materials or rawest points and then rebuild it from there. Um, so she interviews a lot of those kinds of people and I can tell she probably herself uh, through that process is going through her own process. And I could feel she wants to know, you know, so she was really obsessing over this Nazarene movement and all the historical documentation and how do we know this is true? How do we know that? What is this? What is that? So, um, yeah, I can see it putting people in, into an uncomfortable position, right? You kind of either have to read into it and perhaps eventually accept it and then change your actions or, write it off as vegan propaganda, which is probably something I'm sure that you've dealt with before with other documentaries. Yeah, it's nice when like, she's in a good example. When she's open, she really genuinely wants to know the truth. She doesn't have a, she doesn't have a block. She's just like, I wanna get down to it. And then she, the more you go into it, it's like, wow, this is amazing. And it just is such a strong case for what we're revealing in the film. And that's what's with cowspiracy, what the health, seaspiracy. When someone's trying to debunk it, they'll just look at the things that are debunking it. But if they're genuinely interested in seeing what the truth is, the more they go down that with an open mind and an open exploration, like, wow, this, the deeper you go into this, the more this is very, very legitimate. And this, this film particularly, you know, when you have that attitude, you're going to, you're going to be like, wow, this is, this is. This is not only valid, but this is huge. This is transformative. This is massive. This is a massive historical transformation of a, you know, Christianity and religion that really transformed the way, you know, from here moving forward will be seen and what it means to be a Christian. It's huge. Let's just go back and double click on Jesus of Nazareth a little bit more just so I get my head around it. Yeah. So the reason that that was significant was rather than being from Nazareth, it was actually saying he is a Nazarene and Nazareans live a certain way. Yeah, and it's important to denote to, especially anyone who's watched the film by the time they're listening to this podcast, one thing that I think that can be a little bit confusing after watching the film uh, that we never actually say, but people tend to think is that we're saying that the town of Nazareth never existed. Mm. 
um, which isn't what we're saying in terms of the physical location. There is archaeological evidence that there was a hamlet in the spot where now most people believe modern day Nazareth started. But it's the point isn't uh, whether the actual t physical town existed. It's what does that name mean and how did the Nazarenes uh, become to be associated with that town of Nazareth? Because we have no historical record of that name until 200 years after the death of Christ. It's not in any maps, hmm. any historical records. It's not mentioned at all by the top historian of the time, Josephus. It's not in the Old Testament, the Talmud. It's never mentioned until 200 years after his death, which one assumption could be, okay, well, maybe that town was, you know, and it, in the cover-up sense, could there have been an invention of some kind to link the Nazarenes to a location rather than focusing on who they were as a people and what they were about? Oh, the one thing that unites Nazarenes is they're from Nazareth. Boom. It's kind of like when someone says, ah, American, you know, mm -hmm. they're an American and they, it, it, it kind of creates a, I don't know, um, stereotype or something. Uh, but the more important thing is even if the town was called Nazareth, then it just wasn't written in historical record. Why was it called Nazareth? It was called Nazareth because of the Nazarenes, the Nazareans that lived there. That was more of the reason is it was a movement and a people that were disassociating with the popular culture of the time, which was heavily centered around this temple animal sacrificial system as the root and the crux of their religious faith and practice. And what was the significance of the, the word thieves and the translation of that word? Well, um, on and it's wild we're coming up on it now palm sunday uh which is the beginning of holy week it said that at the time of christ two thousand years ago just before his death and a lot of christians don't even know this i didn't know this growing up how significant this event was to the death of christ and the trial um the manhunt because it was literally four days uh depending on who you're talking to, there's a few, uh, give it, give or take a day, but somewhere around four days before the death of Christ, this event happened, this significant event. When he went into the temple in Jerusalem, which is the center and the place of worship. And uh, as we're taught, he flipped over the tables of the money changers and was yelling. And, you know, most of my pastors growing up, they use this in sermons to talk about righteous anger when it's mm. the, the times that it's okay to be angry you know and when it's about justice etc um but they always focused on the money changers and that there's a marketplace right and so this particular phrase den of thieves christ is condemning what's happening in the temple mm. and most of that condemnation that we're taught as christians is he's condemning them for making the house of worship a marketplace and that there's exchanging of goods and money um, but really it's what, are, what are those goods and what is that money for that the term thieves ultimately points to. And so that combination is really important. And what we reveal in the film is that that word thieves has actually been a mistranslation. The English word doesn't truly match. Is that something you think people will accept or will this continue to be, I guess, debated and they'll be open to interpretation? Well, yeah, anyone can justify. I mean, I'll say it this way. You're heavily into the science side with nutrition and everything. And I'm sure you've had the experience. In fact, I think I've seen you maybe in debates or different things where you probably get accused at times of cherry picking and focusing sure. on one thing and saying, hey, you're using this study to justify your position, but you're not taking it in context. But it can often be the opposite where it's like, well, actually in context, when you place this event, when you place this whole thing, there's just overwhelming consensus and evidence pointing in this one direction. So to actually hold on to this study is more of a cherry picking situation. So yeah, I think people will find any way that they can to try to continue the narrative that they may have about this particular event, but the evidence is just too overwhelming for them to. Especially that direct link of the mistranslation is Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah. Like when you when you link that directly to it, you can't really argue it. And yeah, the Jesus. And you know, Jesus spoke in Aramaic. Um, some of the earliest gospels were probably written in Hebrew, but we don't have them. What we have are the Greek gospels. So it's like already three translations there. Then you got to go from Greek to English, and that's where you get the word thieves, den of thieves, right? But the ironic thing is 
Christ when he says, my house should be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Again, talking about the temple and condemning it for what it's become. He's actually referencing an Old Testament prophet. Uh, he had read these scriptures growing up himself and was quoting a scripture that everyone would know from a prophet named Jeremiah. And we have Jeremiah, we have the Hebrew there. So we just go back. Most people have never made the jump. Oh, well, what did, let's look at the Hebrew that Jeremiah said and dig into that. And that word again, thieves completely represent something different and it's it's yeah it's not really debatable i'm sure people will try to but it's not right yeah i mean coming back to your example of science you can sort of go and find a study to support any view right <laughs> right um super interesting what about this idea of dominion over the earth now that's something that kind of comes up quite a lot and at least from my understanding, certain people see that and think that that kind of gives uh, humans this, you know, power to sort of rule and do whatever they want. But in actual fact, in the film, I believe you say dominion has a different definition. Yeah, you can take that one. You know, um, you can take it, and I'll take it. I have a few things, but you. Yeah, well, I just actually like what you recently said. It's funny because we focus a lot on this Christ story with the temple. But funny enough, one of the biggest mistranslations, again, is this dominion word because it doesn't just affect the Christian lineage. It's the whole Western world, right? Because Islam and Judaism heavily rely on this term as well because it's introduced so early in the scriptures all the way back in Genesis. Um, but yeah, the term as, you know, I was raised... Uh, to believe was this kind of power, um, or I should specify, not necessarily in my own family. My own family, we're all a little bit uh, in the line of questioning things, but in general, the Protestant faith, all the way back to the you know Catholic faith, this dominion idea is one of, yeah, kind of rulership, power. God's given us creation or animals or these things for us to use for our own will. Um, but the, the translation, you know, is much more st stewardship. It's, it's, it's used in other contexts in the scripture even for God's dominion over us or our dominion over our children, which we don't just bend to our, well, if we're a good parent, you know, we shouldn't just bend and utilize them for our own will all the time and, and, and you know, nature of the film, kill them or eat them. Like we don't do that to our kids. So it's, uh, it's definitely not the idea that we've been passed down. It's something much different. Yeah. I think it's the most powerful mistranslation too, because when I'm looking at it, cause I didn't grow up religious at all. I still wouldn't call myself religious, but it feels like, especially knowing the mistranslation, it feels like if you look at it as, oh, you have dominion over the earth, you're allowed to do what you will. You can eat these animals. You can do this, you can do that. You're human beings. But when you look at the true translation of stewardship, then it turns into almost a commandment that God says, you have dominion on this earth. You are the stewards. You need to take care of it. Then rather than I'm allowed to, it's something that you need to do. And um, well, that makes sense. You know, it like really transform rather than allowing right. to you. This is your duty to have stewardship. So um, yeah, and the fact that it was even translated as it was is so funny because our prominent figure in the film is an Oxford professor. And I think that's something worth noting too. Like everything that we're saying here isn't necessarily our own uh, statements. It's, it's statements that we've filmed and collected from Oxford professors, uh, biblical archeologists, uh, Old Testament hermeneutics professors, you know? So this is data from these folks and in particular, the kind of hero, one of the heroes of our story is, is this guy, Dr. Andrew Lindsay, who's been speaking on this topic of animals and theology for years and years and years and years and has written 40, 50 some odd books on this. And one of my favorite statements that he said uh, in the interview was, uh, you've got the definition of dominion laid out in Genesis. And then the next verse is Genesis 129, where we're given a plant-based diet. It says, you know, every seed-bearing plant will be yours for food. And so he says, herb-eating dominion is hardly a license for tyranny, which I feel is pretty interesting. So, How many Christians are there in the world? 
3.3 billion, almost yeah. like a third of the whole population. So this that's one of the major audiences for this film. You're wanting to target Christians. Major audience. But yeah, anyone... Anyone... Christianity is so, so big and it's influenced the Western world significantly, whether you're Christian or not. Um, That's one thing that we really want to emphasize in the film is that, you know, if you grew up in the West, Judeo-Christian values in general were massive in shaping the cultural framework of morality and ethics and law and all of these things. So if you're religious or not, this is affecting you. So it's really important for everyone. Um, but again, we go into all the other religions as well and touch on this ethical piece to, to compare and contrast. So it really is a film for everyone, but we do want to see, I per, I'll say I personally, cause it's my tradition. I want to see a massive conversation started in Christianity about this. If someone's listening and thinking, why does it matter what someone said thousands of years ago? And that's probably a, a, someone who's not religious. That's, that's thinking that, um, you know, seeing why are we fighting over the interpretation of things that people said. They're not around today. We live in a different time. We've evolved. We have greater consciousness, more information. Why are we focusing so much on what was written so long ago? Cam was saying so much of the Western world is based on Christianity and patriarchic values. And if you know, if you find out the entire foundation has been a mistranslation, it's gone skewed, and then we can recorrect that the domino effect of what it'll mean, even though it happened 2000 years ago, do, the, the domino effect of correcting that, getting the glitch out of, of what happened is going to be the most transformative uh, domino effect there is. So it'll transform. What does it mean to really be a Christ follower or a Christian? And what does that mean today? Because um, as you know, Andrew Lindsay says, look where it got us today. Look where we're at now. Huh. So if even though it happened a long time ago, if you're Christian or not Christian, once we fix this glitch, then it's a very, very powerful thing that will transform our, our future. Right. Because ultimately, Christians want to follow Jesus Christ. Right. Right. So if provided with the right information, they might make different choices. Exactly. The glitch. Clarify that a little more for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that like, recently. Why... Why was there a glitch? What was the incentives? Was there ties between religion and animal agriculture that many years ago? Well, or yeah. How did this come about? Well, the thing, putting in context 2,000 years ago, this Temple of Jerusalem was not only a place of worship, so it's like the Vatican. It's also a place of all the commerce, not just some of the commerce. It was in Jerusalem, basically in the middle of a desert. It's not like they were selling all these vegetables and fruits and and cars and bicycles and things. It was the entire commerce was based on killing animals, sacrificing animals for money. So it was just a mass slaughterhouse. So now you have basically like Wall Street. Um, you have you have the Vatican, and then you also have a governmental structure there, which is so now you have the White House or a whole you know a whole government building all packed in one single framework of a temple. Um, and so it's so powerful that not only, you know, when he was shutting this down, he knew what he was getting himself into, that um, it was really it was really shutting down the entire fabric of the system that was controlling everything at that time. Um, kind of, uh, and so the, gl- the glitch being, what was the intention and what was really happening at that time? And what did he do that they still talk about today, the money changers, the den of thieves. And if we find out that what he did four days before he got crucified, what he really truly did and their true intentions of him and the disciples that were doing this along with him, that glitch being removed and the veil removed, like, oh, wow, that's what was going on. That's what he meant. That's what was going on. That was their true intentions of how the commandment should be, thou shalt not kill, should be uh, do unto others. You know, it was like, da, 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 da. And um, so it, removing that glitch of the mistranslation in the veil will just to get clarity. of. Will this be new information to most Christians? Or is this information that people are likely to have come across, but because of some type of you know, implicit bias, 
they choose to ignore it? I think it'll be a little bit of both. I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of Christians out there that ha- that don't even really read their Bible that much. So any information can be new information to, to them. And that's not pointing a finger in any way. It's just the nature of it. You know, uh, sometimes people are Christian, but they only go to church on, say, you know, Christmas or something like that. So, but then there's a lot of Christians that it'll be information they've heard, um, but ideally seen with new eyes, because that was my story. Mm-hmm. I grew up reading the Bible a lot and um, taking it very, very seriously. And so it's been a process of the colors of the story almost becoming vivid or in a different way, realizing I might've been colorblind and seeing orange is green, Mm -hmm. you know, in a way. Um, And therefore, yeah, just completely when, when you, it's one of those things that when you see it, you can't unsee it, you know, like the, the, the images you can look at and it looks like a scattered mosaic, but then you unfocus your eyes and you can see a face in it or whatever. And then after that, it's almost like you can't unsee that face. That's, that's what it's like for me. That's what it's been like for me is that once you see the thread in the Bible and then let alone the historical documentation around that, you just can't unsee it. It's too powerful. Every little piece of the puzzle fits together in a way. And the big challenge is, is you can only talk about one piece of the puzzle at a time. And so the real challenge is to get people to listen long enough uh, to how hear. You show the big picture. Yeah. How has this changed your relationship with the church? Well, years ago, uh, I was, you know, for many years, I was a gospel musician. It was my full, you know, devotion, but it was also my career. Um, And I basically did step away from that to be able to honor what I was going through, ask these questions, spend more time on that. And so I've step quite a bit away from the organized side of church and religion, but I still have carried, you know, my faith and my desire uh, through the whole process. And if anything, I feel more connected to my heritage and my tradition than I ever have um, through this process. And, and, and I'm excited to keep doing that. And I'm excited to bring that back into the church. Why do you feel more connected? Is that is that because the interpretation that you've sort of unearthed is a more beautiful one yeah it's more beautiful for in one sense um i i love the process of just kind of revelation of discovery of epiphany you know seeing the dots come together and so there's a satisfying thing with that just in general um but i think it's the experience of certain cognitive dissonance kind of melting away and almost feeling my brain (laughs) come fully online with my heart and my conscience um, that I didn't realize was distorted before. And you can be a Christian and be a good person, but you're still not immune from cognitive dissonance. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. What do you think the strongest rebuttals will be, at least to this Christian part of the the story? Well, I mean, the first thing straight away... um, when arguing if Christ was, you know, by doing this act and being a part of this Nazarene movement, if he was actually uh, a part of that practice, abstaining from eating animals or flesh products, um, most Christians will immediately say, well, he ate the Passover lamb or he ate fish. Um, Those are the quick, you know, off the hip ones most of the time. Uh, There's other ones too, but, Again, there's all kinds of translation issues, conversations that can be had around all of that, uh, that goes so deep that again, once you see it, you can't unsee it, which we can get into, but I just don't know if your audience, how, the, the level of interest to go that deep into scripture and everything. I mean, for example, one is people will say, Jesus ate Passover lamb, but it never says that in the scripture anywhere. Jesus ate what? The Passover lamb. So every year uh, in uh Jewish tradition, they sacrifice lambs for the Passover. It's celebrating their exit out of Egypt. You know, the story of Moses when they leave Egypt uh, from their, from their slavery under Pharaoh. Um, But it never says that in the scripture anywhere that Jesus ate Passover. It says that he told his disciples to prepare Passover, but then they enter the last supper and what's on the table at the last supper. We all know bread and wine, the Eucharist, you know, so, um, 
why are there religious holidays like that and Thanksgiving where there is you know, sacrifice of millions of animals? Really good question. Um, well, breaking out of the historical, I mean, I'm sorry, breaking out of the scriptural and going a little bit more historical for a moment, uh, through research done and really uh, popular materials such as Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, Jared Diamond, um, I think uh, the book Sapiens went really deeply into this as well. There's uh, overwhelming evidence that the earliest tribal humans, um, when they started domesticating animals, that that was its own glitch or its own split in the system where um, now they're domesticating these animals, vulnerable animals, namely. They're not domesticating, you know, lions and cheetahs and these kind of things. They're d domesticating the most vulnerable sheep and goats, et cetera. And when that started to happen, from that moment, we're creating a surplus of populations, uh, overextension of resources, um, all of these elements that kind of led these tribes to then have to go outside of their territory to get more resources, to get more people, to get more cattle, um, which is, you know, we talk about in the film, the word capital literally comes, it means head of cattle because your worth is determined by the heads of cattle you have. So these tribes had to go get the resources from other tribes. And that was the beginning of war. The tools that were used to domesticate the animals and for the agriculture were then used and bent to and, and for hunting uh, for war. And then from the from the war, you get women and children that are left over and those they become slaves. So slavery, the, all these pieces of the system that are devastating and oppressive, et cetera, are kind of linked to this moment we domesticated animals, um, which is another piece, again, historically that we talk about. So um yeah. What was your original question right there? Well, I'll say one thing. It's, it's like why are we killing, why yeah, are we yeah. eating animals for Thanksgiving, Easter, and Christmas? Yeah. It's, it's a, we're living in a patriarchal, sacrificial, ceremonial system. So when we have these big events for so long, okay, what else can we do? And the patriarch, well, we'll kill and sacrifice this animal to make it even more so of a, of a yeah. ceremony. And, you know, if you think of a matriarchal ceremony, it would not be going and finding some very helpless animal or, or, or like docile yeah. animal and rip it and kill it and then have a ceremony around it. That's very patriarchal ceremony. Um, so we just, it's continued on till today. And I feel that's a big part of why we're doing that. And even in general, you know, that's the whole thing with what was happening in the temple at Jesus's time. This was like a Hellenistic, more, you know, Greco-Roman tradition that had infiltrated that system at the time. And, you know, it's all, a lot of it too is seasonal fertility type things, you know, uh, this kind of idea of relief that these rituals bring, you know, uh, abundance or provision in some way with the gods and everything. And again, what I was getting to with that whole lineage or line of thinking is that there was some point, uh, where, um, we don't know the chicken or the egg kind of thing is it which came first but at some point this religious idea and this idea of killing animals became merged probably partly because of the guilt because you know before this system um in more indigenous tribe bulk communities they see animals as totems as you know these characters and these traits and these beings to be honored and sacred but then they had to start eating them and killing them and domesticating them so they kind of have to shift to this other type of ceremonial sacred act to be able to do it in a way that feels i guess more humane so they can kind of live with themselves right right do you think it's possible to be christian and eat meat or animal foods and not be a hypocrite with everything that you've learned for me personally, yeah. Or I think I don't think it's possible is what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't. For me personally, um, I think the clarify too or is that once you know, you know, if you don't know this, the, like the pastors in the film, they're not being hypocritical because it's just not a question they've never even been asked. But once you go down that path and then you really are open and you see, wow, this is the truth. Then if you continue to do it, I feel it's hypocritical to call yourself a Christ follower knowing what you now know, but it's once you go down that road, you know. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. 
track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. What is the difference or distinction between being religious and being spiritual? It's a good question. Well, one thing that I recently learned that's really interesting, again, etymology of words is fascinating. Translations of words are fascinating. We've often, through the telephone game, gotten it wrong over time. And the idea of the word religion that we have is this very dense, you know, um, commitment type of thing that most people say, oh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, because I think the idea and the delineation is religion is about sticking to this, you know, set of ways and thinking, whereas spiritual is being more open to the kind of cosmic unfolding of everything, right? But ironically, the root that we have for religion, it's a Latin word, uh, religere, which really means to reread, restudy, re-lecture, reinterpret. So religion should actually, in fact, be the process of challenging oneself's uh, idea, you know, your own ideas, your own thinking, your own ways. Right, which comes back to your initial question that kind of sparked this whole journey, which yeah. we haven't really stated yet. What was that question that you stood up and asked Kip? Um, is there a spiritual way to kill an animal or more bluntly, how would Jesus kill an animal? Mm -hmm. I have to ask, did you go back and refilm that or did you happen to have original footage? That was that was actually a reenactment. A reenactment. Yeah, we did. yeah. Yeah. Is that how you guys met? Yeah. What is Oh yeah, really? Day, it's a true story. True true story, yeah. Is that the LA Greenfest is a true story, just we didn't like most documentaries, they don't have the camera at the time, but you have to re every sure. one of my films I had to reenact the first part of it. Mm -hmm. Um but uh, yeah, we met at the LA Greenfest and I was doing Cowspiracy screening. And just a few weeks before uh, Keegan, who I did the other films with, he said he didn't want to work on this next one. Um, and so I was like, all right, somehow, you know, I'm going to meet that. that and again, later. too, I think you get this, but just to clear it up, because it's already starting, you know, there's the whole, oh, these guys are paid actors and it's this whole thing. Mm -hmm. They're trying to yada, yada, yada. Couldn't be further from the truth. At the time, I was deeply going through these questions and battles and studying. And like I said, had to step away from a lot of my community because I couldn't have the conversation with them successfully. There, it, there was a shutdown. There was a wall. There was, it was a challenge to have the conversation. However, when I was at the festival, it's important that I was at the festival working uh, because I had left my career as a musician and I was doing odd jobs, helping my friends with different product sales and things that they were doing. And I had a friend who had a chocolate company. So I was working this festival, just living, so, out, of your van. living <laughs> out of my van at the time, trying to figure out what I was going to do with all this happened to be at the festival, which funny enough, wasn't a very good festival. And I was like, kind of ready to leave. But my friend said, Hey, take a pass. And you know, when you're off your shift, go, go walk around and check it out. I was like, ah, I don't really know that I want to, but I saw some friends, followed my friends, wound up seeing his screening and knowing, Hey, I could talk to that guy about this. I bet I mm -hmm. could talk to him because I knew of his films, uh, Cowspiracy, what, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, so the rest is yeah, history. We, and did you know it was, it was a documentary at that stage or you had to go down the path of actually researching it and then you were like, hang on. We have enough here to make something. No, it well, an interesting like moving all the way back to Cowspiracy. Cowspiracy was supposed to be the three pillars: what's the environmental impact, the health impact, and the ethical impact of raising and killing eighty billion land animals and trillions of fish. And for me, that's the ethical side is what I'm most connected to. Uh, why I went vegan, and I think it's the most interesting too. Um, so the first edit of Cowspiracy was all three of those. But as we were doing test screenings, we realized people are like, you're trying to cram way too much. And at that time, it was 60% of the environment. And it was like, oh, man, we have to make three films. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it had to be the ethics one at the end. So the whole notion and how that was going to look and 
it was something I was really excited for because it was the one I was more interested in than the other two. But how exactly it was going to unfold, I don't know. I used to go to, you know, all the vegan festivals, and you always see there's the one booth that has Jesus was a vegetarian. And I'm like, I don't want to go there. I talked to the person, not knowing there was something in there. Um, but it was it was a long time coming. Where definitely a lot of some of the framework, you know, you can see the imprint of the other films. But then to meeting Cam and then having, I mean, it was really divine interaction. I really, it's incredible that to be, for us to co collaborate <laughs> at that perfect timing, then it to blossom into what it was today. Um, yeah, it was just really special. So yes, there was some inclination of what it was going to be, but we took such a wild ride over five years, just one reveal after another, not only in the Christian thread, but all the other things you see in the film. We didn't know we were gonna to go to India and be in car chases and do cow mafia, go to Gaudamai Animal Sacrifice Temple, and then all these incredible people we worked in. So this film, more than all the other ones, had a more organic unfolding, way more than the other ones. The other three, I kind of play a character, Ali kind of plays a character we know going into it. This one really was just it like, discovery. wow, wow, wow. Yeah, and I, I I feel so blessed that it happened because at the time I was thinking well, I would just maybe try to write a book or something about this, which would be probably me sitting behind a computer mm -hmm. going through scriptures and giving the arguments on both sides and all of that. And that was a process that was already starting. Um, but much harder to get people to see that big picture. Exactly. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned cow mafia there. <laughs> <laughs> How has the animal agriculture kind of industry responded i you know i think what you're shining a light on is probably something that they would want to shut down and how's the animal agriculture industry feel will take this film or in general or the other yeah, films this, or? this film um you know taking a look at religious texts and you know trying to shine a light on what a more accurate interpretation of those texts would be. I feel they're so intertwined. We, we go in it in the film, you know, especially for living in the U.S., as Cam said, the, the Christian barbecue and just when you go in the Midwest, the animal agriculture industry and Christianity are just, I mean, it's one, you know, I don't know the percentage, but God, it would probably be 95% are Christian. Um, yeah, as we show in the film, Tyson Foods, like the biggest, you know, uh, meat and animal product production uh, company is as Christian, they 100% profess Christian values. They have a whole priest system. Is that coincidental or well, that's I, I, You know, I feel, especially even more so, now we have a little breathing room of like looking at everything and getting these good questions, is that I feel it's about, it's so, lack of a better word, evil or just, morally challenging to raise and kill and especially if you're in the in the in the in the same room or looking at the animal in the eye and slitting the animal this beautiful being that wants to live that you have to balance it with this very strong religion religious and and, and you know going to church and praying all the time because it's almost i don't say guilt but it's just it has to be balanced in some way so i feel that's a big part of it um because the you know when you go into the animal agriculture industry or, or what's happening, it's it's a it's a rough one. I'm gonna to say too many bad words, but <laughs> that makes sense. Say something else, Cam. Um, yeah, no, I mean it's the. I was just gonna say, yeah, the ties are are there. I mean, we talk about in the film. Uh, there is a guy. Uh, a really sweet pastor that was making a video a couple years back. It all, all this was happening while we were making the movie too, which is just so wild to see the percolation of just this topic coming to a head. We can feel the energy of the time being now. Um, and this, this particular pastor on the Southern Baptist Convention's uh, ethics division of their website, um, which is my church background. I grew up in the Southern Baptist kind of church. Um, a guy posted a video about animals and about the, some of the atrocities going on in factory farms and relating that a little bit to like the pro-life movement and the concerns that Christians have. And uh, they took the video down almost immediately and issued an apology letter to all of their uh, parishioners, so to speak. And 
said, yeah, this was kind of not in alignment with what we were doing, yada, yada, yada. Um, and that same, not long after that, that same guy made a video about what would Jesus eat, you know, asking some of these same questions again, immediately after, um, you see the animal agriculture Alliance on their home page, creating and promoting a book. What would Jesus really eat? You know, uh, heavy meat based, you know, having these kind of conversations. So you see already this effort that's being made to counterbalance and, um, for sure in that sense, but then even beyond that, I mean, you asked one thing I'd like to share that I wanted to share earlier is you asked 2000 years ago, how did this cover up happen? Is there any ties that we have? Um, there's historical documentation from a hundred year, hundred AD where emperor Trajan of the Roman empire is corresponding with the general, uh, Pliny the elder about his division of the empire that he's overseeing. And Pliny is explaining, Hey, this movement of these Christ followers are moving into town. And they're in secret and they're talking to each other. But what we've noticed is that sacrificial temples are stopping and the meat sales are down basically. And so he's reporting Trajan like, Hey, we're snuffing them out and we're trying to stop this. And since we've been doing that, they're firing back up again, the meat sales are up again. And, you know, so you see, and, and what, what they're doing is they're threatening their life and saying that you have to engage in this sacrificial system and renounce your faith or your, your ways, or you're dead basically back then. So, but the priests today that are kind of, I guess, propagating this, uh, interpretation of consumption of animal foods being Christ-like. Are they being incentivized by animal agriculture directly or are they just sharing the information that they think is correct? All my family background is Mormon, not my immediate family. I didn't grow up and they're all in Utah and they're pretty high up in religion and it's their way of life. And with this film, I've had discussions with them and you can just tell they just don't know. There's not like they're getting paid or there's like some collusion going on. Like we really know this. It's just that they don't really know and they don't want to be confronted with this because if they are, they'll have to look in the mirror and be like, am I really being Christ-like and a follower of Jesus if I'm eating and killing animals and putting animal flesh into my body? I think it's just a block that they do not want to face. But I don't feel that there's... There's naturally money going in through each other because it's kind of one, but not like, you know, behind closed doors, I don't think. Yeah, that, that, it's, it's, it's such an unconscious thing that's happening, like we said, with all the cognitive dissonance and these things and just the lack of knowledge of the conversation because it was suppressed or lost so long ago. But to his point about it is naturally flowing in some ways, but it might not be literal deviant behavior. But for instance, the Church of England in the UK, they own a lot of land in the UK and most of it is used for livestock farming. So you see how it's tied in together. And so money is being made through church means, property ownership, livestock production, and all these things that are intertwined. But it's just been that way for so long that it's, yeah, it's not something that someone behind closed doors is whispering about. I don't think, I think it's just the way that it is. So animal agriculture, there's a lot to be lost if the status quo changes <laughs> essentially. Yeah. And that's what I would emphasize is that, um, as I said, I don't, and as Kip saying, it's not like we're pointing a finger at religious people. If anything, they're of, a victim in a way, as mm -hmm. I've felt by an industry that's really been the culprit in all of this over time that has demoralized, you know, utilized different tactics and advertising and communications that have demoralized our ethics to look the other way, to hide slaughterhouses behind these walls so we don't really know what's going on in there, to paint a particular picture that creates that cognitive dissonance in our mind um, so we can't really hear what our heart is telling us. We're going to go on a kind of a tangent here, but um, when people, if they're watching the film, they want to debunk the film. Is that what's f fun or, or interesting about this film versus the other films? Is the other ones, What the Health and Cowspiracy, they'll do all these other, other they'll show all these other different um, 
um, data points and all these other studies that have been done. With this one, if you don't feel Jesus, or if you feel Jesus could kill an animal, or you feel there's a yoga way to eat animals, and yogis can eat animals, and Buddhists can, then what we say is, what we were going to have in the film, we just didn't put in, then can you please show us? Can you please, if you are, say, a yogi, can you raise two baby ducklings from birth and honor them and name them and love them and four months later film them once a week put it on youtube then after four or five months then kill them when they get killed and show how a yogi would kill them or show how jesus would literally kill them and then that's where the argument kind of just falls apart because then it's not about scripture and it's not about facts and this is about literally you show show us how to do it because at the end of the day we have asked a lot of people who are our friends who they'll say, oh, I can do it. And then, let's see, because when it comes down to it, especially when they raise that animal and they love it, just being a human being and just loving, it's going to be very difficult to show the Jesus way to take someone's life. It's just, I don't feel it's possible. We haven't found anyone who's been able to do it. And it's something that we're, we want to challenge other people to, to do that, but at the end, we don't want them to kill the animal. We want them to do what Jesus or a yogi or Buddha really genuinely would do. What if they don't kill the animal, though? So I think there's this, there is certainly a bit of a spiritual movement that's into regenerative ag, and I think would argue here that they're buying meat from farms that are giving back to the ecosystem and the environment and the animal lives a good life and is killed in the most humane way possible is it possible to be spiritual and eat meat if it's being sourced like that well it's i don't feel it is possible what's interesting is the regenerative happy farms they grow up this beautiful life they're loved by people who take care of them, they, they, the animals grow up in trust and love and connection. And so when that animal one day is said, go on this tractor and trailer, and you're going to be taken away from those who love you all by themselves, and then taken to a slaughterhouse, there's not a humane slaughterhouse. And well, there is a humane slaughterhouse or, 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 you know, where the humane animals go or the factory farm goes, they go to the same slaughterhouse. And so the difference between that happy animal who, who, who felt trust, love, connection to humans, now when it's getting to be killed, not only is it getting killed, but it's a sense of betrayal that's probably the saddest part of that. This sense of I love to live and now I'm getting killed. The drop off is so much more massive for a happy animal to get killed than someone, than an animal that's in a factory farm that lives a miserable life, doesn't have no trust, no love, no connection to anything, then it gets killed. The difference between life and death is just is a sliver because right. it's basically living hell. Has and then less, it's, it's less liberation. To live for. But when an animal is very happy, the, the drop off is massive. So what's more tragic? The more tragic and the more cortisol when you look at it from a physical level. The cortisol is booming and it's exploding throughout the the um, the body and the betrayal is probably even as much as sad as the killing itself. So when people say, "Oh, I eat happy animals," I'm like, "God, that's the most tragic way to kill an animal because that animal wanted to live, and then you're eating this animal that wanted to live more than anything, and that's inside of you now." Um, so it's very tragic. And then on just on a you know, environmental side of the regenerative that's already been debunked that the animal isn't getting back in the days when the bison, they, you know, the, the theory that the animal goes back into the earth, the blood goes back into the earth, everything goes back into the earth and then recycles. It's not just the poop and the pee, it's the blood. And so the animal dies there and all the animals are eating it and it's recycling. They're taking these animals out of the farm and then the documentary ends, you know, the little big, uh, biggest little farm or common ground. They share everything except the part where it should be the most biggest focus where the animal gets pulled off, taken away, and the blood isn't put back into the earth. The animal's killed tragically. And so these documentaries, they only show, you know, a, par a partial, partial part of the whole story. And they're leaving out the most imperative from an environmental uh, scientific side and from an ethical side of of what we're doing to them.
Yeah, it's the really, again, on the side of the sadness and the betrayal of a happy farm, it's also quite twisted. It's the Hansel and Gretel story. You know, it's these animals that are fed so well and treated like the little kids in Hansel and Gretel only to then be popped in the oven, you know, with this tragic twist at the end, you know. Um, Which we had in the movie for a bit. We had a Hansel and Gretel, a yogi described that. Um, and it's one of the most bizarre, powerful nurseries, nursery uh, stories that we know and is because of that, because we're pretending that we love them and saying really want to kill them. It's so twisted. I think one of the the shots, if I get if I got it correctly, was shot at a meditation place here on Rose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought I recognized that. Totally. Uh, what do you guys oh, yeah, yeah. think okay. about Peter Singer's kind of philosophy what you were just saying then about an animal that has been raised regeneratively presumably has more to live for right i've heard him say or at least i i think i've heard him say that it's better for an animal to have lived and lived a good life than to not have lived at all have you heard him say that yeah and that's a lot of that's what's it. When we when you go to Joel Salatin's farm, the pig that lives this happy life, and he pats, "Oh, what a beautiful happy life!" Pigs live for fifteen years. It, they're getting killed at six months. These animals are not living happy lives. They're getting killed at the equivalent of a puppy, the equivalent of a t- uh, a two year old two year old toddler. So it's like, oh, look at this two year old toddler. What a beautiful life you lived. It's better than not living one at all. It's just such a twisted uh, rationale that that's it's so bizarre that is it better that this two year old baby lived two years of a happy life than you killed it in the, in the context of humanity and the earth. So you think Um, it would be better not to breed those animals into existence in the first place? Not especially when maybe if it's again, and still no, but these pigs and these cows, they're getting killed at months. They're equivalent of a puppy. So I guess ask yourself, is it better for to, to you get a puppy at four weeks old and then you're going to kill this puppy at six months. Is it better that than to have just not bred this puppy at all? Like to have this fun four months of being a puppy? Like, yeah. and, and, and forgetting too about the, the insemination process and the breeding itself and the suffering and things that go into that side to create that life for six months you know there's just so much there that's maybe not being considered like okay well maybe that you know short life of that pig or that cow or whatever it's got this you know quote unquote beautiful life that's short but what about the animal who over and over and over again are being inseminated and you know potentially that's their whole purpose is just that process you know that's probably not the best life for that being who's bringing that being into existence yeah and regenerative farm that's a whole nother thing that it's like i don't want to do a cowspiracy too at all but with someone can just do one on specifically regenerative it is so ridiculous because you're just these animals that live on the farms, it's where are the males, where are the males, like the male cows, you know, they're, they're so much of these are the males are killed at birth for anything in dairy. Um, and again, they're, they're taking the, the bodies when they're killing them rather than putting back into the soil, they're taking them out. All the land use that is needed, all mm-hmm. the water that's needed, only 15% come out of excrement. It's so inefficient. And, and all the wildlife. I mean, all the wildlife. biodiversity. The biodiversity that's yeah. lost. I mean, I went personally, what he's talking about with the, the, the pigs, um, Joel Salatin's farm. I mean, he's like one of, he's like the farming hero, you know, and I got to see it with my own eyes, how much pasture is being created uh, there. And not only that, literally him saying hawks and eagles need to be reduced mm-hmm. because they're taking away the chicken population right. that's being used and it's like th- the amount of wildlife that either naturally has to go because of those land or they physically you know but the counterpoint that i often hear to that is yeah but to to grow all of these plants you have to kill you know thousands millions of small rodents and, and insects yeah and we we the film was <laughs> we really wanted to include that in the film um <laughs> One, you only need, what is it, this six, this is like cowspiracy. You only need a 16th amount of land uh, uh, if, you're, if everyone's vegan. One 16th. So when you're going to Joel Salatin's, we're, I'm from Virginia too. Um, 
it's all forest. It's all beautiful forest. He just clear cut it, just acres and acres and acres and acres of wildlife and birds and road, everything just decimated. But if it reverted back to say, okay, let's make this a sanctuary, not, not, not raise any more animals, you could reduce that by about one sixteenth and grow all the organic food. You could put a little fence around it. Um, and the rest of all the hundreds of acres revert wild, uh, rewild, rewild. It's not as romantic, though, the story yeah. of stop eating meat and you can regenerate the environment versus, hey, you know those foods that you love? You can keep eating those and be a part of regeneration. Yeah. Well, and the funny part, too, about that argument of croplands killing a lot of animals as well from an ethical standpoint you know so just soy for instance as we know 80 percent of it's fed to livestock anyway so you're killing if you're eating animals you're killing a lot more of those animals that you're concerned about in croplands but even still there's so many funny layers to the argument there's no data that i i've seen and that people have discussed there's no data to show that cropland in general doesn't have any more net deaths than just natural land because there's predator prey situations happening in wild land you know some might even argue that certain crop lands have less net deaths than if that land was just wild based off of the cycles of life and what's actually happening there so there's so many funny nuances to that argument that you can go down yeah, and we're going to have when this film comes out maybe by the time people we're going to start having debates and conversations and particularly the regenerative one when these other films came out we we People who'd come out against them, whether it's what the health or cowspiracy, they would speak up and write articles and we challenged them to a debate and then they would say no when it came down to it. They would say all the way, yes, we'll talk and we'll do an open, unedited debate. And then at the very end, they wouldn't, particularly what the health. So with this film, though, we're going to open it up again on every one of these, every one of these angles, regenerative being a particular one, because it is... It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous that this conversation is even being like, that's how bad it is. I won't, it's a whole diversion of going, but that one, whether it's ethical or whether it's regenerating the soil or it's whatever, it's a, it's a complete, you know, talk you about a glitch. Alan Savory debate, George Monbiot. Do you see that? When was that? No. It was, it was recently. It was like a university, oh, Oxford really? University oh, wow. debate. I had George on after, oh, really? afterwards. So um, how was it? we've kind of quite comprehensively covered some of the holes in the regenerative oh, really? how, Who won? Was it, was it, it was an open debate? It was an open debate. I'm not sure they declared a winner. Uh, I think it was pretty unanimous that George was the only one interested in actual science. <laughs> um, so they actually didn't really get that far into the debate because they, Alan sort of turned up and wanted to debate a different proposition. Um, so it was interesting anyway, worth, worth listening to. And the episode that I did with, um, with George, how did you convince Joel to be a part of the, George, Joel Salatin to be oh. a part of the, uh, <laughs> to be that a part was, of the uh... documentary did he did he know what you were filming? Has he seen the the film? I bet by now he saw it because we showed actually speaking of like common ground, someone from that team saw the film and pretty sure he shared it with him. Um, probably by the time anyway, he will watch it soon enough if he hasn't. But with that, we like the other films. We we're reaching out. We're exploring what regenerative farming is about. Is this the way to raise and kill animals? Is this the way to do it, to feed everyone? And so when we're reaching out, you know, I'm not reaching out with my name, especially nowadays, but we have a line producer and we talk about the film that we're working on. And so we say we're looking to interested in finding out what you're doing, you know, and, and, and on all respects. So we're, we're open with that. And then when we were going to film that in Virginia, kind of a, for a funny thing i was gonna i we even we were right there that day i bought a wig a mustache and i was gonna change my voice because cowspiracy was still fresh right. it was only a few like he is this guy again cowspiracy what the hell <laughs> say spiracy <laughs> yeah so and then and we thought it was more for funny and then right when we got it's good we didn't right when we got there <laughs> I'm like, we can't do this so so cam ended up going i stayed in the car and he had an earpiece in and uh, we were trying to work on on tell, asking questions to Joel. While yeah, I yeah. We, in there. It was still, you know, at that point, he and I worked together on everything, but we had a camera crew 
in case this happened. And so the camera crew was able to come in with me. And then I actually had Kip online, you know, just with the iPod earphone, just so he could hear in case there was anything he wanted to add from what he was hearing. But then when we got on the farm, we lost reception. And okay. so I just did the whole thing on my own. But um, yeah. So were you ever afraid of kind of, of being caught out? Well, when you were there, because not really, because there's no way. Like if I was, it was that's what, once it got down to that day, it was like I was scared. And like, this is stupid. It's not worth it because it was. We feel especially when you watch that, even that, you know, every one of these edits or every one of these interviews and these little short stories, they're they're you know that that's a good five to seven ten minute short film on just his farm. The more you go into that farm, the more twisted McDonald's bizarre, you know, because he has this weird thing of loving these animals but then he's calling where he kills the chickens you know the wheel of fortune and it's just these disconnect and bizarre things uh that are happening but um and just yeah i mean for me on that day you know we really are genuinely trying to see if there's a way if there's something that he's doing there and and coming fresh off of my background, like I said, uh, hunter, fisherman, uh, barbecue, you know, I feel in some ways admittedly comfortable with a being like Joel, like, um, on a farm like that. Cause he's a Southern guy doing his thing home, you know, close to the land, small, you know, family values, probably a little bit anti-government, you know, th these things that I can relate to a lot. And so I'm seeing what he's doing and I'm like, man, you know, in, in, in ways I have respect for the entrepreneurial nature and what he's trying to do. However, there's the genuine experience of what I'm seeing and what's being shared that's definitely lighting up all of these contradictions and again, cognitive dissonance and what's really happening. For instance, you know, this, again, this whole idea that these are the happy animals. And then when I ask, oh, well, where are the pigs and the cows killed? Oh, they're killed at the slaughterhouse down the road, you know? <laughs> How much of this boils down to incentives, though? Because I have to think he's like genuinely proud of the way he's going about it in comparison to factory farming. Right. Right. And you were talking before about like rewilding. And if you did that, there'd be much greater biodiversity. You're talking about all the land that he's cleared. But would he be paid to rewild <laughs> to improve biodiversity? And if not, is he not therefore just doing the best that he can with his land? Yeah, if he was, <clears throat> if he was incentivized to do that and pay it, I, I, I feel at, like most people deep down, he does love his animals. He does does love everything. And he even mentioned at the very last part of when our interview, he says, um, you know, you can't kill too many animals every day because it's really hard on you. Mm. It's like. And they're just kind of, you know, it's almost there. He knows that. And that the deep down, I feel he would love to turn his beautiful property into a sanctuary. If he could have the same amount of money and his lifestyle and have it just turn into a sanctuary, it's just, I feel that's his true, you know, it actualize him of who he is. Um, but yeah. there's no incentivizing. You have, it's very difficult to have a sanctuary. As yeah. Our friends know. And just the, you know, the out of balance public funding for animal agriculture versus plant agriculture. You know, it's 60, I think in America here, it's 64% some odd around there, uh, public funding for animal ag and 0.04% for plant agriculture. So the government funding is just out of control. And I had a, I had an experience of that recently, uh, when we went to Texas and interviewed some ranchers there and everything and saw firsthand just what the subsidy process looks like when a farmer can just go once a week or every other week and go cash out their check to go do i mean it's so easy to do and there's so much of it especially in texas you know because they're constantly losing animals to disease and drought and this and that and they can stay in business because they just go down to the local government office and get their subsidy check so what was the motivation to cover regenerative agriculture and visit Joel Salatin's farm polyface in the first place because that kind of seemed like a little bit of a sidestep away from speaking directly to Christians or religious people well a big inspiration especially back then is the my the biggest little farm came out uh, you know that documentary mm, that, that was huge and 
just another one where it's just it made me upset because I'm watching that and I'm waiting for such an just as a filmmaker, it would be so interesting of got to go in to see this family that loves their animals and their little farm and have to kill one of their animals, you know, just even a filmmaker, whether I'm vegan or not, love animals. And then they just don't go there. And then they're, they're just this beautiful, happy little farm. And this is what everybody should do, let alone the obvious, um, the obvious facts of how much land they had to clear and all the wildlife they had to clear and the coyotes that they're, you know, having to kill. But that was a particular one of, of not showing the other part of the happy farm. What's the happy killing? So we felt it was really important to go to one of the most renowned regenerative happy farms, Joel Salatin, and who is a Christian, a self-proclaimed Christian, who says, I kill animals the way I hope Jesus would. <laughs> so you might have missed that the first time watching it, but he literally says that, which ties perfectly into our film. And... Um, that's how he feels Jesus would do it. So it really, really ties in exactly of, of, of the, of our intentions of finding the ethical way to kill an animal. Yeah. And then folding, it's like, we, we start with the basics, you know, for me early on, even, even in my own research, realizing that there are 90 billion land animals killed every year. If you don't include fish with fishes, it's trillions, mm -hmm. but uh, 99% of that is factory farming and understanding, okay, well, most people agree that that's probably not the best way to do it, that it could be better. And so you just go down the line, what is the best way? And so, at, you know, you look, we looked at kosher, we looked at halal, we looked at uh, all of these different practices, indigenous and everything. And then it led to this point of, okay, well, yeah, this, this style of farming, maybe it's not that hardcore farming that most people don't agree with, mm -hmm. but let's look at this farming that a lot of people are agreeing with and see what that looks like. And like you said, he's happens to be a Christian too, and professes these things. So it was a perfect match to really understand the best scenario of what would a Christian ethical farmer do? Mm. And, It'd be and, interesting to see a follow-up conversation with you guys after he's watched it. Yeah, yeah, it'd be great to have uh, as a debate. Uh, he, there's actually a debate of him and Gene, uh, Gene Bauer, who founded Farm Sanctuary. Same thing as the, and it was, um, the it was an official debate, like in uh, Oxford or, or, or some school. Mm -hmm. um, it is okay to eat animals, and that that was the debate. One says one side and the other, and Gene won pretty substantially. What's interesting too is we felt that we didn't know how J Joel killed animals. It was a little more hardcore than we thought. Um, but what's interesting about the whole notion of ethically killing an animal, even if he would have done a prayer before killing each one, at least for me, when I see someone, and there's some on YouTube who are doing this, that they're praying over the animal or they're doing some ceremony. The more they're doing that, the more twisted it becomes because it is like the Hansel and Gretel. Imagine the witch, you know, blessing and praying for them. It's like, what are you doing? Like, okay, kill this, but don't like try to make this thing, make yourself think that this is some holy thing that you're doing. So it's like the more they try to make it a mm -hmm. spiritual experience, the more twisted yeah. it gets because the more further away it gets from you're taking someone's life to this is a spiritual thing. So... Bizarre. Yeah, I call that mental gymnastics. Yeah. You know. We took that line out, huh? <laughs> mental. Or did she still say it? I can't well, remember. Yeah. And you know Melanie Joy? Yeah. Uh, she, yeah. Her, as you, her interview is a lot longer and is really good, like she always does. But mm -hmm. we had a whole part about mental gymnastics because mm -hmm. that is literally. And that is what, when you remove the mental gymnastics, the clarity that comes and you know, why the Einsteins and the Leonardo da Vinci's and the Teslas why there's this link between all these most powerful, influential people throughout time and not eating animals. I really feel it is when you remove that gymnastics, these right. blockages that who you really are and the divinity of being a human being, when you remove that, you really tap into something that's way greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you don't, the gymnastics is just, just, it's just trying to rationalize, rationalize. And it's just, it's, it's a right, lot because of it, it feels uncomfortable to have, to not be aligned. <laughs> In yeah. your actions and values right so you have to come up with some type of story that creates some alignment <laughs> yeah yeah and that's what's fun is with this film more than the other one is when people are trying to debunk it then we just hey let's let's see you do it we have a camera let's do it all friendly and then 
than the conversation. I've done this with a few people. One of the ones, a, a producer from Common Ground, um, once he was debating regenerative farming, we were going down the more cowspiracy and debating how ridiculous it is. And then I said, well, you killed that cow. How did that feel? Whew, he shifted. And was, he'd never done it before. He actually killed the cow. And then he just became calm and he, he went back. I'm like, what, what happened that time? He's like, my family was there. We, we raised that cow. And he was very difficult. I cried. Mm. Is that Ryland? Yeah. Yeah, I've, been, I've, been, <laughs> I've, I've, I've gonna... interviewed him before. What's uh, that? I've, I've interviewed him before. Uh, he but, mentioned yeah. that. And yeah, I don't want to mention the name. but And I, he's a great guy. I like him because he's so open and we have these conversations. Yeah. And even that, it was in the middle of Catholic gratitude. But that's where it shifts. And I'm like, well, then it doesn't, it doesn't align with who you are. You know, there's... And then he was trying to rationalize that, but we have to do this. You don't, you don't. In Cafe Gratitude, you know, you don't have to do that. My friend uh, who lives in Montreal, he used to do organic animal agriculture with farming and he switched, transferred to veganic. And now he's one of the most uh, pro, um, you know, prolific, I mean, yeah. prolific veganic gardener. Now it's called veganic farming in the country and the world. And he's getting way more harvest and way more yields and way more nutrients. And the soil is just lush. And you just see him light up from what he used to be. But there's a story that you need manure yeah, to you create don't. really fertile you soil. Yeah. You don't. Soil spiracy. That's the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're digressing a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we've spoken a lot about Christianity. You just mentioned before halal and kosher. Let's just talk quickly I guess about the decision why did you feel it was important to cover some of these other religions within this conversation well, i'll say one thing one it was with this film i've always heard of kosher heard of all these things i really wanted to wait till this film to start actually exploring it because like because and so we just i me personally i didn't really know how it was done i thought it was actually you know in the film we have this animation of, of showing how it's done and it's really bizarre, but we just wanted to see if perhaps there was a little bit more of an ethical way of doing it. If the animal mm -hmm. possibly felt less or that. And we felt, and there's a few interviews that didn't make it into the final film of a slaughterhouse worker who did kosher and halal. And one more recently we just talked to who did all, worked at a slaughterhouse. And he said the day that they did kosher and our halal, was the day most people would show up sick that they didn't want to come. That's how that's how disturbing halal and kosher was to the slaughterhouse workers because you're just doing it in a bizarre way and it is more personal. But we just want to explore all the ways. Yeah, all the ways to see if there was an ethical way to do it and to just understand, you know, um, though there, I think it's actually 2.3 uh, billion Christians worldwide, there's, you know, Islam is coming up right behind that that's a massively growing movement um and then you know with all the other religions in their respective locations around the world same story as christianity if you are living in india say mm -hmm. um you may not be hindu um but still are deeply affected by the moral and ethical frameworks that have fed the society that you're living in especially around uh animals and that's a great example of it too because we went to india to see their practice of how they revere the holy cow and again not even pe people who aren't even particularly devout in their hinduism still practice or support these kind of things at a political level you know uh it's a it's, it's quite the political thing as, as well there and so um we wanted to go and just see all the different ways that this conversation around how we treat animals manifests itself through these different cultures muslims and hindus they they don't follow Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> so well, Muslim, Muslims revere Jesus as a prophet heavily. Okay. Yeah. But. In, in their religious text, what does it say about the consumption and killing of animals? Well, Islam is, you know, obviously the Quran is their uh, main text, but they also use the Torah as well. They use the, the Genesis story and everything. Judeo-Christianity and Islam are these Western religions that are all very much tied at the core and at the root of their narratives. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of similarities with Islam as well about, you know, like I said, dominion is a big principle um, as well. But with halal and this nature, similar to kosher, 
for them, there is a right way to do this, um, a particular way, and to not utilize that way is, is, is its own type of sin or falling out of the path of Islam. And, um, and then in Hinduism, uh, you know, most of the religion is predominantly based in a vegetarian ideal. They don't eat or consume any meat or especially red meat um, because they revere the cow as holy. Um, but the ironic thing is with all of these religious, same thing with Christianity, it's across the board. We're not just like particularly pointing out one thing. We, we go into Hinduism expecting or hoping that we see, oh, wow, maybe they have something interesting to say about this reverence with the cow, but there's a whole hypocrisy there as well. And probably one of the biggest cover-ups or conspiracies in India uh, that's happening where these holy cows that everyone says they're revering are actually secretly being uh, slaughtered just like every other cow. In fact, uh, probably more than anywhere else in the world in some ways. Really? But not for consumption? Yeah, for consumption. For, for consumption. Ex yeah, export. export. For export. Export, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so we happened to, when we decided to go to India, it ironically was at the same moment that uh, the government there instituted a slaughter ban on cattle because again it becomes a political move um, for the different uh, political parties that are trying to come into power and they instituted the slaughter ban and so we entered india into this whole scene where basically the slaughterhouses are shut down supposedly not all of them or they're going there's these illegal slaughterhouses that are going on but uh, what ends up happening is everyone's excited oh we're protecting the holy cows you know they're they're sacred to us but the culture uses a lot of dairy, a lot of dairy, not just for consumption, but also for ceremonial use. They use ghee and milk for all of these ceremonies and everything. And so there's a disconnect because the dairy industry is producing all of these cows. The cows have to go somewhere. Something has to happen. They have a cow problem in a way. There's a lot of cows roaming around eating trash, all these things. So that's where the Islamic populations and states come in, where they're then tasked with the underground effort, so to speak, to move the bodies of these dairy cows to other places, illegal slaughterhouses or to Pakistan or Nepal or somewhere else to be slaughtered. And hence what Kip mentioned before, the cow mafia and these underground syndicates and networks of these groups that are moving these cows and all kinds of violence and clashing of you know political uh religious extremists over this issue and that's being hidden from the population because if the population saw that it would be against their values and beliefs and their religion yeah and it's full on again it's just same thing as any other thing we explore there's just a lot of cognitive dissonance you know we asked the dairy farmer on the spot we had to we went undercover into one of the dairy farms there and we asked him about the process of what he's doing with the cows and the milking and everything. And then we say, well, when the mother, the holy cow, you know, it's the female that they revere. When the mother is done with her milking, when she's given all of that time, then what happens to her? Because supposedly they live their full lives. And they say, oh, well, then she dies naturally. And then, you know, Kip asks, well, what is naturally? Well, she's sent for slaughter. So it's like that level of dissonance, you know, where it's like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild, but it just goes to show the power of the tradition and misinterpretation. And just to be clear, that's the greatest revelation of the film, I think, for both of us in some ways, um, is that there, none of this is meant, this film isn't bashing any religion. In fact, it, I feel it highlights, you know, from my own personal experience with my religion, it highlights the true nature of the religion that was always there and brings it into this beautiful space. And you realize that all world major religions have this through line. They, there's maybe all these things they don't agree on about divinity, about heaven and nirvana and this, and all these conversations that you could argue about. But one core piece that unites all of them is this, we shouldn't be unnecessarily killing other beings. Well said. I think a Rich. Clip. That was a clip in the social. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think Rich Roll said on stage, "There's the story of the film, and then the story behind the film." Oh yeah. And I'm of the understanding that there were a bunch of challenges <laughs> in pulling this off. What were the biggest, I guess, obstacles in in creating the documentary? 
so much of the beginning, <laughs> we had so many variations of telling the story, um, pushing the limits of being storyteller filmmakers, um, of blurring the lines of all sorts of different things. Uh, and the big thing is like having a film on ethics. We even actually even started this one time. Like, how can we make a film on eth how we can make a film on the ethics of raising and killing 70 billion animals and killing them for food and make that even interesting or entertaining that someone would possibly want to watch. And then, so that was part of it is to make something such a serious topic, entertaining, um, interesting, informative, some humor to it. And then how to, once we started going down the rabbit hole of making the film, there was just one thing after another that we ended up interviewing in a little separate side, small, short film stories that we had to take out. For example, one, Sammy the Chicken. It's this guy who has a chicken as his, basically his partner, and he, they go through life together, and he does everything for the chicken, and it's just this beautiful friendship um, that we had to take out. And then we had tons of these, and what can we leave in? What can we take out? How to how to organize it in a way that it threads together and we're going to India and we're going to Hinduism and Christianity and it goes on and on. So just the editing part of how to pull it together was a massive, massive ordeal. It was a huge one that took us literally years. Yeah. And then once we edited it and we felt really confident about it, um, our streaming partner didn't <laughs> feel as confident. They, they, um, you know, wanted to, take it in a bit of a different direction. Like I said, we, I think maybe started going down a particular thread with the Christ thing and some other things that, uh, yeah, we, we just couldn't agree on. Is that because they would presumably have a large number of subscribers that are Christian and this challenges them? They're a little different than when Cal Spiracy went to health. They're, they're a little, it's a little bit different now. You know, they're so massive and I think there's a little bit more control of things. I don't know. But there was specifically a few things they wanted us to take out and go a different direction. And we just, we felt the story had to be told as powerfully and as with the most impact as possible. Or we feel like, like a better words, we feel like we're selling out. Yeah, for one. being censored. Being censored, yeah, and when, and when ironically the film is about uncensoring two thousand years of censorship, and then all of a sudden us being censored, so that was the irony there. So we couldn't do it. That's a hard thing to hear, though, because the distribution is obviously incredibly important to the the impact. The, when you're doing a, an original, they keep all the footage. The only it's only on their platform. Even when we did see Spiracy at the end, we had we had a website and we had just just basic call to actions. No, you can't do that. You can't even put a website like nothing. So people watch say see Spiracy and that film was massive. It was number one across the world. Everybody knows about it for about four or five months, and then just boom drops off. Not really, you know a full call to action where we can release other footage. We can have it on YouTube. Everyone who's in Thailand, who a big part of, you know, the Thailand was a big part of that film. Probably no one's seen it in Thailand. They don't have Netflix, you know, hardly anyone there. When we go to India filming this film, we're like, wow, this would be on Netflix. Everyone's like, where's this going to be? This is the biggest cover up in India that cows get killed. Netflix, no one watches Netflix here. So, and as we were doing that, we were realizing as big as we feel Netflix is, there's a way wider reach if we're able to put this on our own platform, YouTube, Google Play, have it um, a pay it forward model. So even if you don't have money, you're able to watch. So the plan with this film is maybe it won't have that initial spike where everyone in the world sees it once, but it's gonna have this own journey that's gonna last years and years and years that in the long run, way more people will watch this film than if it was just on Netflix. And then the other big thing is, we'll be able to release all the extra footage. The content from this film is so powerful. Every one of those interviews um, is like an, is an hour and a half. And so that's another great thing. And then, then the call to action, community support, we'll be able to do as well, so. So where can people go who are listening right now that wanna watch it? Go to Christspiracy.com and there will be a pay it forward model on there that anybody can watch and if you are able to contribute and help 
to someone else to watch it and help fund this film that's that's being released. It'll be on Christspiracy.com as well as extra footage, extra content, and a bunch of support along with the goal is by then when people are listening to this, it'll be on Amazon Prime, YouTube, ideally everywhere. But Christspiracy.com for sure. Yeah. And do I need to worry about you guys? Your yes. personal safety? Yes, you need to protect us <laughs> well i think at the beginning you kind of insinuated that or at least a few people encouraged you to perhaps not look into this encourage what encouraged you to perhaps not look into this question yeah i mean it's one of those with all the films they've been they're pretty daring it's just we feel we do we feel protected we feel protected by the animals and by the mission of what we're, we're, we're just promoting compassion and, and undercovering the truth and the beautiful nature of what these religions at the core are. When you watch the film, people are always surprised because it's like, oh, you're not really bashing anything. So at the end of the day, I feel, if anything, the other films kind of bash some stuff, you know, things that in this film really just reveals the beauty um, of the essence of what these religions are about. So at the end of the day, I think that's the the, the takeaway. Mm. Well, thank you guys. I commend you on the grit and determination working on this. Was it five years? Did you say it was? Yeah, it was about five years of filming. But mm. that whole ordeal where we realized we were stepping away from the platform, it's been a couple of years of just figuring out what to do to be able to make sure as many people as possible can see this with the least amount of restrictions. And that process has been very, very challenging. It's been a whole other separate film, basically, we could have made if we would have captured everything about just figuring out how to get to this point. But yeah, anyone who's listening right now, too, we're just coming out of theaters. And, um, you know, this theater release uh, has been its own ordeal. It's just doing something independently uh, definitely does take a lot of extra blood, sweat, and tears. We're we're learning, but it's all worth it because in the end, I think the long game is, is better. Yeah. Well, as I said at the start, I'm not a religious person, but I found it super interesting. So I encourage everyone to go and check it out. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, Thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.